Okay, everybody, welcome back to episode 35 of the More Doors podcast. Today, we are joined by an actor, a Tony Award winning producer, and a best selling author turned multifamily investor. We are going to talk to him and my other esteemed co hosts right after this. Okay, welcome back. Today is another wonderful day, and we are here with episode 35 of the More Doors podcast. I am here with my esteemed partners and colleagues, Brian Force and Nick Good. What's up, fellas? I really feel that you've brought the extra energy today because yes. we have a you know a Tony Award winning, you know, producer and actor and best selling author. And so you really put on your acting skills. Bro, this is when just you me. did that. It's intro. just me. Just, I don't know. Is, I don't know I'm if being I've authentic. Heard it I think as I'm more, authentically me. He's more excited that a fellow New Yorker is on the show. Holler. Yeah, you do. Just, you do yeah. bring it out a little bit more. I do. And uh, I might say use guys once or twice. Yeah. Guys. yeah. I was surprised and, you didn't wear any chains. Uh, yeah, you can't see him. And uh, maybe <laughs> Jesse will use because, like, when we cut this, you know, Buchowski always does a little singing intro. And he was he was going to sing the Phantom of the Opera, and you're like someone was asking, was it still on? Yeah. And you said it's I think it's off now. It just came off, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So my cousin John Riddle was in Phantom of the Opera, and uh, what was he? I think he may have been the Phantom. Really? Is that the one that wears the mask? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, pretty much the Phantom guy. Does he bro. talk at all, or does he just sing? He sings. It's I've never a, seen the it's show. a musical, bro. They, well, yeah, that's all they do is talk sing. in between songs. Well, that, no, no, he stepped no. in the role of Raul. So whoever that guy is, yeah, I don't well, know. Our guest yeah. might know. Yeah, yeah, our guest definitely knows. Yes. So speaking of our, our guest, we're going to welcome him in just after this. But before we do, let's thank our sponsors. First and foremost, check out the folks at Deep Blue Capital, aka us, DeepBlueRE.com. Go to the website. Hit that subscribe button, put in your email address, get invited to some amazing parties. More importantly, get updates on upcoming deals that we have in the pipeline. So very exciting times in the market right now, specifically here in uh, North Texas, mm -hmm. and I'm sure in other places across the country. Uh, but we have a robust pipeline. There's that SAT word again for those paying attention, Nick. Um, and uh, stay tuned. Go there, subscribe to our email list. We have a fantastic newsletter authored by the one and only in-house seamstress, Mr. Brian Force. And best-selling newsletter writer. Best-selling newsletter writer. Yep. Also, go check out tourstudios.com, T-O-R-E, studios.com. Hit up Big Jesse. Tell him he's got the best beard ever. Mm -hmm. And if you want the best ever podcast put together, he's going to hook you up. Might even save you a few clams. Just compliment the beard and... Tell him is uh, he needs a little extra beer, but uh, beard butter. That's what it's called, right? I think it's beard oil. I use beard, I use beard oil. oil. Beard oil. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, they're very specific. I, I messed about that what up. Use, yeah. Okay, right. sorry. <laughs> anyway, let's welcome our guest. Let's do it. So our guest today is a uh, is an actor. He is a Tony Award winning producer. Two times. Two times. Best selling author. Let me let me say that again. Best selling author. Most importantly, he's from Brooklyn, the land of Junior's cheesecake. Let's welcome to the show <laughs> the one and only Matt Piccini. How you doing, Matt? Hey, um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for such a wonderful introduction. <laughs> no problem. We want to pour it on today. We're, you know, we're 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 superfluously giving kudos. Oh, whoa, whoa. really good one. <laughs> Somebody's been studying. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, brother. We really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. Absolutely, man. Well, give us the we we always like pull up the website and the footnotes and all that stuff but it's it's it never does anybody justice to share their own story so give us the background on who is matt a little bit about your journey we we were fortunate enough to meet in person at an event recently and we listened to you talk about your story and i thought it was incredibly compelling and just it was a it was a joy to listen to so uh give us the background a little bit who is matt and, and how did you end up here talking to us knuckleheads well thanks uh <laughs> I, I hope I can live up to <laughs> to the hype behind my story. <laughs> I grew up in the land of Mickey Mouse. 
I grew up in Orlando, Florida, and moved to New York City to pursue a career as an actor. Um, and I did that. I was a professional actor for about five years. Uh, and then in the mid '90s, I got involved in uh, the website development. You know, uh, back in the the, the dot com heydays. Uh, actually, I had so much work coming in from web development. I I started. I was doing that on the side as I was acting, that there was so much work coming in. I actually started my own boutique agency. And then in 2001, the dot-com bubble burst. My business completely imploded. And as luck would have it, I got a phone call from my landlord at the time who told me that I had to move out of the apartment I was living in. <laughs> so wow. I needed to find a new place to live uh, and trying to find a new place to live. I actually had to find a job because my business had completely failed. So I, I, I went in house at Showtime, the cable television channel. I had, they had, were a client of mine and uh, I found a place, but instead of finding a place to rent, I found a place to buy. And I bought a place up in Washington Heights. So way, way, way upper Manhattan, not necessarily where I wanted to live, but a place, an area that I could afford. And a uh, little over two years later, I sold that apartment and I more than quadrupled my initial investment. Wow. Uh, you know, I, I, I was making good money at the time. I was making six figures, but the one transaction was more than a year's worth of salary. And that that's kind of when the light bulb went off in my head. Like, <laughs> how, do, how do I do that again? Because that that was that was really easy and, and you know, made, made a substantial amount of money. So that's what set me on the journey to, to doing real estate. I did it as a hobby as I continued to work in digital marketing in, in New York City. Uh, and I, I did digital marketing for about 18 years, actually, in the city. But the last 10 years of that, I was doing real estate as a hobby, just something I did on the side. I, I bought a property and I uh, made it a, like a vacation rental home. And I started fixing and flipping properties and uh, found out about real estate syndication uh, and got involved in real estate syndication and have built up a portfolio now of, of over 10,000 apartment units that I've invested in two thirds of that portfolio or deals that I've invested in passively a uh, little over 4,500 doors as a general partner. So it's over $638 million worth of assets under management. And um, I, talk a lot about real estate. I, I, I coach people in real estate, people who are aspiring to be general partners. Uh, and I speak on stages across the U.S., which is how I met you guys. Yeah, And that man. brings us to today. <laughs> That's an incredible story, man. And, and I'd love to dive in on something specifically that you, you just said. Sure. Um, you know, you've been through the entrepreneurial roller coaster in different spaces, right? The dot com bubble, which I would love to talk about what it was like. I was to a stockbroker during that thing. It was a, it was yeah. crazy. From like different perspectives, I could talk about that all day. The web development side, the, the the Wall Street side, right? Like what it was like to experience that. But I can only imagine having a really probably flourishing business where you have clients like Showtime um, to watch that evaporate when the dot-com bubble bursts you know you keyed in on something your first move after that you know was to go buy a house and so i can only imagine that at different times you've looked back on your story and said you know i had a lot of limiting beliefs around what i could accomplish and now looking back i realized like those limiting beliefs might have been holding me back and you've taken a lot of bold action it seems like in your career and now that you coach a lot of people what do you what do you see as sort of the limiting factors of people really getting into real estate and building a portfolio or a career? What holds them back mentally from just taking that leap the way that you did? You know, um, I, I'm not really sure. It might be all the drugs that I did in the <laughs> I'm just bringing that up because of what what someone said right before it's the recording. <laughs> but, but no, I, I I don't know. I didn't. I don't. I I feel like maybe it's the acting background, right, mm -hmm. or something like that. But I've I've always been able to. I shouldn't say always been able to, but I've I've pushed through fear mm -hmm. in the past, right, um, and. When it comes to you know performing on stage, right? And I used to be an actor. There's a lot of fear and lots. Of, I mean, the I think the biggest 
I don't know if I have this quote exactly right, but I believe the biggest fear in America, people's biggest fear is, is public speaking, mm -hmm. right? Getting up and, 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 and exposing yourself, but also being able to try to take on, you know, the role, the persona of other people. Right. Yeah. And I think that that probably is a big factor in allowing me to just kind of almost be, uh, you know, not, not have any, not be scared of anything mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. I, and I and i don't want to say that i'm not scared of anything because i because i am but i i feel like i can go up and and kind of face that fear um now i'll never jump out of an airplane i'm not like a big you know roller coaster mm -hmm. daredevil kind of guy but <clears throat> what i have been able to do is i think safe set up safety nets for myself mm -hmm. so like let's go back to the first thing that you that you had mentioned where you talked about me going ahead and, and losing my job and then buying a house. Well, but that, that's a, that's a nice way to frame it. It makes me seem a lot more daring and, and, and brave and bold. What really, what happened was I had to get, I was being kicked out of my apartment. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to find a place to live. I wanted to live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. When I looked at what the rental prices were for me to rent something there, it was a lot of money. My sister actually had lived, was living in Washington Heights. She saw a thing on a bulletin board and I got it and I, and, uh, you know, I called the number and, you know, I, once I did the math and it was pretty simple math to do, it was very clear that my monthly payment would be less mm -hmm. to own a property up in Washington Heights versus renting a place. Yeah. And yeah. I would be gaining equity. Right. So that was a, a calculated move I did. And part of that calculation that I did, I didn't do that math on my own. I actually spoke with my dad. My dad uh, used to be in real estate as a residential realtor. Mm -hmm. uh, he then was in a uh, food service industry for, for the majority of my life. But as a young kid, he was a residential realtor. So he knew how to run the numbers <clears throat> on those kinds of things. And so I had my dad and his kind of background to kind of lean on. And, uh, you know, my mom's experience uh, in uh, she, she she had her own company. Both of my parents were very entrepreneurial and uh, she had a roof consulting company. Right. So somewhat related to real estate, not really. But between them being both being entrepreneurial and both having some, you know, real estate and, and somewhat tangentially related to real estate background, that leap didn't seem like the craziest thing that I ever did. Mm. And it's one of the things I talk about in my book. You know, my, my book, Backstage Guide to Real Estate, starts with that, that, that incident right there where, where I, lost the, the, um, you know, I lost the apartment that I was living mm. in and my business ex imploded all the way to where I am now. And it, it teaches the lessons that I learned along the way and what I've done throughout the way, and I didn't even realize I was doing it at the time, now I'm very aware of it, was that I would always bring in people, bring in team members who were more experienced than me to have, uh, to, to sort of help me, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of guide me along the way and set up some guide rails so I didn't go completely off course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And yeah. that's been instrumental in my entire career. That's how I got to where I am now. And, and hopefully what I'm doing for other people as I now mentor and, and guide others. Yeah, I love that. A hundred percent. Yeah. Well, and you keyed in on two, you know, two, two really, I think, uh, foundational principles there. And the one that a lot of us crazy entrepreneur types that never really got into the, the W2 style workforce, maybe don't even uh, realize about ourselves sometimes or take for granted is the idea of being comfortable being uncomfortable, right? And I can only imagine being an actor for so long when work is not always consistent and then being on an entrepreneurial path and web development, like it's just, you get so used to not having that consistent paycheck that that level of comfortability with that allows you to do things that people that are used to getting a standard amount of money every single two weeks they get a little bit uncomfortable with and that transcends into other areas of your life it was too expensive to rent on the upper west side and a lot of people won't do something that makes them uncomfortable geographically but mm -hmm. you said washington heights is not only affordable i can get build equity i'm willing to make that sacrifice even though it doesn't really match the level of comfort that I want right now. And those little things, if you're looking to develop as an investor or build your portfolio, 
a key foundational principle is you've got to get more comfortable with being a little bit uncomfortable. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and then obviously the second is no one succeeds alone. You've got to build a team. Definitely. One of the things that I really like what Matt said, and, and we've talked about this on a couple of different episodes now, is this concept of transferable skills, right? So Matt, you know, you know, talked about how him being an actor, right, kind of helped him round the edges on fear and become more comfortable with certain things. And you think about going in front of a room and talk like when, how we met Matt and right. He's talking to a, to a room of, of people about ownership philosophies and stuff like that. He's He's got that comfort level because of his previous acting experience, right? When he's probably on the phone and doing an investor presentation, he's more comfortable because he's presented in front of hundreds of people before. Right. Um, I think the three of us were super comfortable picking up the phone and uh, building relationships with investors because all we know is to pick up the phone and do business, yeah. right? And and you take those things and you just apply them to different areas of your life, and it's 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 amazing how it fuels progress and and results. 100%. 100%. Matt, let me ask you this, and and I like, you know, I like to follow very easy formulas. Right, I'm I'm the simple-minded one out of this group. Me, Nick. Yes, <laughs> and I noticed, right? You know, as as I was, you know, you know, I didn't I didn't come out to the truck yards that night, um, and I wish I did, but um, to to watch you speak. But you have a five step formula for your multifamily success. What you know, and that's something I know that you know, and you've got a, a Facebook group that I just a, applied to be a part of. Hopefully, I make the cut. Um, of course, you'll make the cut. <laughs> yes, you heard it here first. I am in. Would you be willing? <laughs> would you be willing to share that th part of the, those steps? Because you know, when people are listening to this, whether they're driving the car, whether they're working out, you know, they're they're kind of halfway listening, and and they're they're trying to to make that leap. And we really digest things and understand it and, and formulas and steps. So would you be willing to share that a little bit with us? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to share it with you. And Thank for you. anyone who is driving in a car or, you know, when you get to a place where you're out of computer, I'm sure you guys will put it in the show notes, but you can just go to pacheni.com slash and then just type in the number five. Don't spell it out. Just type in the number five, pacheni.com slash five, and you can download it for free. OK, I give a lot of free uh, information out there. I have a YouTube channel where I just tons of free education. OK, uh, the five step formula for multifamily success is uh, really just based around uh, the, the, the five pillars that you need to succeed, which is, you know, number one, assessing where you're at and where you want to go. OK, uh, number two is learning the basics that you need to know of how to put together syndications and structure deals. Um, and, you know, you can do that for free. You can do yeah. all of this for free. Now, I joined a mentorship group and that's how I think I was able to get to $10,000, right? And, and grow my business as quickly as I did. I think joining the right groups um, can can collapse time frames, but you can also do this all for free. And so I talk about different ways to do it for free, or or to pay for it um, in, in the in the in the five step guide. But you know, learning the structure, how to put things together, financing, uh, taxes, right, um, metrics, terms. Uh, the next thing is is I talk about market mastery. You know, mm -hmm. I, the biggest problem I see is people looking in too many markets for deals. You, jack of jack of all trades, master of none, yeah. right? And so picking one market and focusing on that, I talk a little bit in the guide about the things you need to look for in a market and how you need to meet the brokers and the property managers and the other property owners to be successful. Uh, then the next thing I talk about is deal analysis. Um, and then the final thing that I talk about, I call selling your story. Mm -hmm which is really all about yourself, uh, your brand, and uh, getting out there and, and meeting other people, whether it's other people to partner with or potential investors, whether it's brokers and property managers. You have to sell yourself to brokers and property managers. You know, when, when you think about it, a broker who has a deal, they could be working with trying to get that deal listed for weeks, months, or even years. I mean, I, I have brokers who, you know, they, they, they know that I own a property or two and reach out to me and just keep checking in every six months, yeah. right? 
once they actually get something mm-hmm. listed, I mean, they, they usually pre- present a broker's opinion of value and then eventually hopefully get, get the listing and then they have to do all the marketing materials, right? Maybe photos and videos and then send it out to the database and then the offers come in. There may be multiple rounds, a best and final round. Uh, all of this could be months and months, you know, before you even get to a point where the deal's awarded to someone, then a PSA is signed, and then you're looking at, you know, 60 to 90 days from the time the PSA is signed till the deal closes. So you've got a broker who's been working for, I don't know, nine months to maybe several years without getting paid at all. Yeah. And they're only going to get paid at closing. So they're only going to want to award the deal to someone that they know is actually going to be able to close on the deal. So that's also part of it, right? Being able to sell yourself to a broker as, hey, I am a real person, a real player in the market, and I can close and I can get to the finishing table, you know, get get to the closing table, get to that finish line. And um, so so those are basically the the five steps that I talk about in the the five-step formula for multifamily success. uh, I love that. (laughs) And and, and you so much truth there and you hit the nail on the head and, and steps three and five really stick out to me. One, uh, you know, for aspiring investors or maybe those looking to transition into a GP role, that is the truth of the nature of this business. The barriers to entry can be high mm-hmm. um, and they don't have to be overcome over and over and over again. Once you establish yourself as somebody that a broker knows can close, the path gets quite a bit easier because, you know, like Matt just said, they want to work with people that are going to be able to close. That's how they make their money. And so they're going to come to you first. And so if it seems really far off right now, get those first couple of deals under your belt, things get much more, more simple um, or say easier. The market mastery, I want to focus on just a bit and, and, you know, learn a little bit more about your story in that regard. This is something that I, I know the guys harp on a lot is being a master at what you do. And geographically, I think that's incredibly important in multifamily for several reasons. Uh, underwriting across the country is very different in different areas, right? Insurance, R&M, things like that. We talk about deal merge a lot or underwriting and taking aspects of one and accidentally transposing them to another. If you're trying to do deals all over the country, the amount of knowledge that you have to have to be good at every single one of those markets in a master, that's like talking to a pilot and being like, what plane do you fly? And they're like, all of them. Even spaceships. Yeah. You're like, I don't, that sounds really, I'm not getting on a plane with this guy at all. You know, I, I really believe in going really deep in the markets that you, um, that you're going to focus on. And so how did you sort of develop that market mastery? Did you just start in your own backyard? Was there a market that really spoke to you? How did you develop that mindset around, I need to become a master in the markets that I'm going to invest in? Yeah, I, you know, the, I think that a lot of people are, it's the, it's the number one biggest mistake that I see mm. is people just looking, you know, they're looking at a deal in Orlando, they're looking at a deal in Chicago and then in New York. And um, you have to understand what's going on literally block by block, I mm. think to truly be competitive. And, you know, that rings true for you know, the place that I live in right now. I I got a great uh, apartment, well, townhouse that we live in, and we were able to buy this several years ago at a very good price. The neighborhood wasn't that great and was right next to an abandoned, boarded up KFC that was breeding mosquitoes by the truckload. But yeah, (laughs) it's it's a whole other story. (laughs) But um, it was about five blocks south of the Barclay Center. It was about eight blocks north of what at the time was the only, and it was the first uh, Whole Foods in Brooklyn. And so we knew that it was on the path of progress, although it was next to, you know, maybe the blight of the neighborhood. uh, We knew what would happen, which has happened since then. It's been bought. Someone did an assemblage of pretty much the entire block and has built a luxury high rise. Uh, right next to us where, you know, they're selling one bedroom apartments, uh, you know, for essentially what we bought the whole town home for, you know, many years ago. So uh, if you, we were able to kind of figure that out, we did take a little bit of a a risk and a little bit of a leap, but we saw what was going on. We, We knew it was on the path of progress, but somebody who lived in Manhattan even, 
you know, or lived in Ohio or Florida, just looking at the numbers on the building, never would have seen that. Right. Yeah. Yep. They didn't understand what was going on in the neighborhood. And so that's one of the things that I've been able to do. And I think it's really important to be able to go to a market and understand what's going on. You know, when you when you go and you're underwriting your deal, you're looking, you're using, at least I work with my students on, on using four different sources uh, for, for underwriting. One of them being the, the T12, right? The trailing 12 months of profit and loss. Another being the rent roll. A third thing being a, a third party report, such as something from Yardy Matrix or maybe a, a co-star type report. Uh, but then most importantly, number four is, is your own market knowledge. And if you look at the data points without that market knowledge, you might think that, oh, you know, I'm looking at CoStar and, you know, the rent growth is, is 3%. I'm just making that up. Mm -hmm. You might know from your local market knowledge that that's not going to continue. This, this part of town is kind of on the way down. Or you might know, hey, the Barclays Center is four blocks mm -hmm. north and the Whole Foods just opened up eight blocks south and this is on the path of progress. And I think we can push that rent growth past 3%, maybe 4% or 5%. Now, I'm, I'm not condoning people be aggressive with their underwriting right now. I'm just saying that that local market knowledge may change for better or for worse the assumptions that you're putting into your underwriting. I love that. So so let's let's take that point and, and talk about you and your journey a little bit. So we're so 10,000 units, impressive portfolio. You said 4,500 or so on the on the GP side. So yeah, where where are your holdings? You know, um, I'll I'll go through that. That's a, an important point that I that I did want to bring up, which is that you know I can't be the master of every market. Right. Right. I can't know every market and every broker. And that's why I like to invest passively in deals of other operators that, that I've gotten to know, that I, that I feel good about their judgment. Right. And, and, and we have to do our due diligence on on who we're going to invest in and, and the project itself. I have investments in um, I have a lot in, in Texas, Missouri, Florida, Georgia. Philadelphia, Colorado, um, New York. Yeah. Um, I think that's, I think Ohio. I think I covered all of them. So pretty much but, everywhere. Got it. Well, yeah. And a lot, and a lot of different places, not a lot on the coastal markets. I don't have anything on the West coast. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a couple of strategic things on the East coast, but a lot of my stuff is sort of in the, in the center. And I'm, I'm actually having an investment on a, a new construction project that I'm working on that's in Canada. Really? And yeah, and I love it. And I'm really excited about it because I am able to diversify outside of the United States, but do it in a very safe way in a, in a country, you know, our good neighbor to the North where that has a stable government, where the contracts are written in English so I can understand them. Um, and a, a place that also has a, a massive, massive need for housing in, in the entire country, but specifically in Ottawa, the, the, the capital city where, where our project is. Um, and a place that's not correlated to the U.S. housing market. So in 2008, when we had the big drop, some markets were you know 75 percent down, right? Yeah. In in the U.S., uh, Ottawa was between five and 10 percent during the Great Recession, uh, and their their housing market went up. Mm. So to be able to sort of diversify my portfolio, and like 99 percent of my holdings are in the United States, but to have a couple of things that are kind of hedging those bets uh, is is something that's exciting to me. Nice. So give us a little bit of, of expertise here. So, you know, we, we've, we're pretty much solely invested in Texas. I think you guys are LP in Florida, right? Mm -hmm. On yep. a couple of things, yep. but all of our GP stuff is in Texas. Okay. And we've talked about, and we've heard a lot about um, networking and building your network and, and trusting the right people. But walk us through your process to vet someone that you're potentially going to co-GP with, right? Where their boots on the ground, mm -hmm. you're 
in Brooklyn watching the Nets and Jay Z, and and you're going to help co-sponsor the deal and and raise capital while they're off in in a in a distant part of the country putting a deal together. So how do you get to know that person? What are the things and questions that you have for that person? And, and um, you know, how do you go about getting comfortable coming on board in that capacity? Yeah. So the, when I first started off. Um, you know, I was finding all the deals myself. Uh, I would go to the market, get to know the market, uh, and and find the deals and bring in um, other people who had experience because I didn't have the experience. So, you know, would my investors, you know, they knew me from business. Um, you know, it was a lot of friends and family at first, and that's grown a lot since then. But they knew me, I think, and felt comfortable with me, but especially on my first deal, it was your first big multifamily deal. So I brought in another sponsor to co-sponsor that with me so that we could we could team up together. And he had a lot of experience. Um, as I've continued to grow, I have partnered with other people, and sometimes they might find a deal. Sometimes I might find the deal. I'm always involved in the asset management of the project. Actually, right before this podcast, I was just on an hour long call uh, with one of our properties in Texas with the property management. We do that on a weekly basis and we, we go through, um, you know, review the different KPIs and, and, and make sure that everything is on track and give direction. Um, that's, that's part of the, our job as, as, as asset managers. And I go and I visit the properties pretty frequently, but I do have also boots on the ground where, you know, I don't know if there was a fire or something and we needed someone to go there immediately, they could uh, get there, you know, and, you know, within 20, 30 minutes. Um, but that's very important to me is to be part of that. I, I have a background when I, <clears throat> when I worked in digital marketing here in New York city, I was a project manager. So I'm a PMI certified project management professional, which just means I'm really good at managing people, budgets, and timelines. Mm -hmm. And so I've taken that transferable skill set, like you were talking about earlier in the podcast, and just instead of doing that on digital marketing projects, I've moved that over into real estate, but still going ahead and managing those assets. <clears throat> in terms of partnering with people, it's something you have to be very, very, very careful about. Um, you know, I, I was involved in a project and one of the people on the project, one of the general partners uh, was, you know, not necessarily the greatest guy. We, we've actually, uh, you know, the person was removed from the management of the property. And, you know, that, that was unfortunate and, and a good learning curve. But um, most like uh, all of the deals that I do, I would say when, when I've partnered with people are people that I've gotten to know over time that I've, you know, most of the time, vast majority of the time, there are people who I've invested in their deal mm. as a limited partner in the past. Yeah. And many times they have also reciprocated investing in my deals as a limited partner. Um, most of the people that I partner with, I've known also for, let's say, four or five years. Mm -hmm. So if I've known someone for four to five years and invested in their deals and seen how they do business and we're aligned philosophically and our values are aligned, um, then it may be the right time to pursue, a, you know, working together and joining forces. Um, you know, multifamily is a team sport, but you have to be very careful with, with the players that you let on your team. Yeah. So you're not just like, you're not just sitting into Facebook groups when the people put out a post that says, need to JV, I need, you know, yeah. $1.5 million by next Thursday. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I get a lot of calls from a lot of people and, you know, hey, you know, if I had a deal, would you partner with me? And I, I just have to be frank with people and say, you know, what, well, like maybe in a couple of years, but like right now, no. Um, you know, I, I tend to people tend to partner with people that I know, or I have a lot of students, um, you know, that I, that I mentor. And, and those are people I would be willing to partner with too, because I've gotten to know them intimately and they've gotten to know me intimately through the one-on-one -on -one coaching that I do. So that's, you know, uh, allows us to develop the kind of relationship that I think is required for you to, to partner with someone. Yeah. I, I think that's really important. You know, this, this business, especially, the last 12 months has, has not been easy, right? And I think we're probably going through another 12 months worth of uh, challenging times at a macro level. 
you have to know that the people that you're going in to do business with and putting your name on an opportunity can handle the stress, right? They can come up with creative solutions to problems. They can innovate. Uh, they have emotional intelligence, right? They're not just going to throw their hands up when the, when the road gets bumpy and say, you know what? Not really for me. Yeah. You know, and then you got millions of dollars on and your reputation on the line. And, uh, I, I, it's funny because we're, we, we've been kind of slowly developing a relationship with, with, uh, someone that's interested in doing business with us. And like, we've done lunches and dinners and, and, you know, the process goes for, for months and months and months. Right. And, and like the other day we had dinner and we literally, we brought our wives out and it was yeah. wonderful. And we spent the entire dinner going around the table, like getting to know each other for three hours, you know, and, and, and just that process of getting to know people and kind of their whole story and how they deal with challenges, really, really important. And I don't think that happens very quickly or very easily. And maybe it did a couple of years ago. And, and you know, we know how that story is going right now. Yeah. Like, nor should it happen very quickly or easily because, you know, like you're, you're saying, you've got to be willing to show up to work every single day and, and make difficult decisions and, and, and be responsible for potentially millions of dollars of other people's hard earned money. It's not something that you want to entrust with somebody that you met 15 minutes ago. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, and speaking of, you know, the last couple of years going forward, the, the challenges at a macro level, what are you excited about in the market moving forward? And what, you know, as, as a GP who has a community of other deal sponsors and things like that, what are you focused on right now to make sure that the deals that you're looking at and that you're, you know, potentially doing in the, in the near future, um, you know, are, are, are stable and generating the returns that we're advertising because a lot of the stuff done in 2021, 2022 is facing a lot of headwinds right now. What are you looking forward to going, going forward in the near future? I'm not necessarily in acquisitions mode mm. at, at the moment. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, meet brokers all the time, get phone calls and even, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? I, you know, I'm not necessarily looking for anything right now. Um, I still look at deals. Sure. Um, but for me, more important than the location um, that we were talking about earlier is, is the structure of that deal. And, you know, how are we, how are we putting the, the capital stack together? You know, what does the debt look like? Uh, you know, this is something I've been concerned with for, you know, since before this big run up that we had, you know, I wrote my book before the interest rates started going through, yeah. the roof, but I was warning about it. I was like, you know, Hey, at the first sign of trouble, you know, there's people who are playing kind of fast and loose here, you know, and I, mm -hmm. I took a very, I think, conservative and pragmatic approach. And I still have a couple of deals that are under stress. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? The vast, the vast majority of the portfolio is totally fine, but you know, we've got a couple of deals that, you know, are, are, are going through some rough times right now because of where things have gone. And it's not just the interest rates. And so that's another thing that I'm looking at is making sure that our expenses are flexible and that we have enough reserves <clears throat> because that's where, where we're seeing a lot of stress just across the portfolio is on the expenses side mm -hmm. where expenses have gone up incredibly. You know, number one, you've got you know, inflation that just brought expenses of everything up. And then you have, you know, insurance has been crazy, especially yes. in Texas and Florida, right? You're, you're yeah. seeing renewal rates that are like two times, you know, we, we have a number of properties where it's doubled. Our yep. insurance premium has doubled. Yep. And it's, a, and, and insurance premium is not a, it's not a small ticket item. Yep. Uh, and also taxes, right? We see huge, huge increases in taxes. So, you know, I'm trying to get involved in deals that are um, that are underwritten in a way where we have really great re um, reserves. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not over leveraging ourselves. You know, I I, um, I I only have done about one to two deals a year. Okay, since the beginning, and last year I only did one deal. The one deal that I did, uh, our leverage on the deal was was sixty percent. Yeah. Um, we assumed debt 
Uh, we assume this, the, the seller's debt. So we have a 3.8% interest rate. Nice. Versus, you know, would have been probably 8% had we gotten new debt at that time. Um, so it, it really made sense. Um, that Those are the kinds of deals that I'm looking at. I'm also getting involved in new construction. Um, you know, the, the the project that I mentioned in Ottawa, I think that there's a lot of opportunities in that and in development and land development is something I've been investing in passively for a number of years, just like I talked about investing passively uh, in other people's deals before partnering with them. I started investing passively in multifamily deals um, before I actually had my first GP deal. And uh, I've been investing passively in, in a bunch of development deals. And now I'm taking a GP role in that. I think it's a good way to um, really get a feel for exactly what's going on. And uh, I'm excited about continuing to do the value add multifamily that's been the, my bread and butter, but continuing to do some some development projects as well. Mm. Matt, let me let me ask you this, right? You brought up you know some some deals that um, you know they're they're a little bit rockier at the moment, and we're we're seeing you know we're seeing a lot of um, you know people that acquired assets during during the COVID era. And they're not doing as hot. What are you, with you being certified in project management and really good at managing people and, and kind of the operational flow, where are you seeing operators go wrong with how they're handling or not handling um, kind of the, the rockiness of their assets and then breaking down maybe the communication? How should they communicate with their investors? I can answer the second part of your question. I, I don't think it's fair for me to to try to speculate on, um, on on the first part of the question as to like what's going wrong. A, a lot of the times right now, and, and again, it depends on on the on the circumstances, right? But a lot of the times right now, there's fundamental flaws in the structure of the deal that the operations cannot overcome. You could be 100% occupied and 100% collections and raising rents and you know whatever and still be completely underwater, right? So I don't, I'm not sure that I have you know the 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 magic bullet for for operations um, and and operations itself. We can do a series of podcasts about all the different things I, I think people could do better from an operations standpoint, um, but I don't I don't know that there's a cure. Uh, for for a vast majority of the deals, I think it's uh, the the um, the crisis that we're having right now is not um, you know, a, a real estate crisis, right? The the real estate is not distressed. The mortgages are distressed. Yep. And that's that's where the issue is, and th so the operations can't fix that in terms of communication. That I think is paramount. Actually, I just had a post yesterday on social media about that. That got a lot of um, a lot of uh, people interested. A lot of comments and things like that. Communication is really important. Clear and consistent communication. So you know whether my deal is doing great or whether my deal is doing poorly, I am sending out monthly updates on my deals. Yeah. Unless I have a deal that we've had for a couple of years and it's super stable, and then, we, then we'll switch to quarterly reporting. Um, I am very transparent. I, um, you know, a couple of things that I hate about monthly reporting that I get as a limited partner. I hate when I get these monthly report. Here's the monthly report. Click here to go to the portal to read the monthly report. Or click here to download the monthly report. And then like I have to go to the portal and did I remember my password? <laughs> Luckily, I have a password manager now. But you know what I mean? Like it, it, these hurdles I put in the body of my email, everything that I think an investor would want to know that they could read in like a couple of minutes. Boom, here's the highlights of what's going on. Now, I do have a link to the detailed financial reports, you know, we were very transparent with everything, but I like to see everything kind of summarized right there in the body of the email. And um, if something's going off the rails, maybe you report more than monthly, you know, uh, 
But consistent communication, keeping your investors informed is important. Well, on the deals that we've had that have had some stress, we've actually done some webinars where yeah. we invite our, you know, our investors to come and like, hey, we want to give you a, a sort of state of the union on um, where we are with the portfolio, what our plans are for moving forward, open it up for Q&A, always record it. So that if someone couldn't make that uh, that live uh, meeting, we send it out to everybody. But that transparency is is key. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hundred percent. And I've said this a million times. I'll, I'll say it again. Right? We're we're all LPs and deals that aren't going as favorably as we would like right now. And I, I'm you know we're we're fortunate enough to have two different types of deal sponsors that we invested with. Those that are communicating at a very high level, and I would invest with them again. And those that even if they turn the deal around, I'll probably never invest with again because their communication is absolutely terrible. Um, and it's just those 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 more difficult headwind sort of times that really show you the people that you want to be in business with going forward. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Well. We want, as we start to kind of wrap things up here, I want to be respectful of your time. You know, um, we, one, we appreciate, again, everything you shared. This has been fantastic. Um, we, we talk a lot about and the investor's journey, getting started. A lot of our audience is looking to grow. And these are difficult times to really get started in a business that uh, seems a little bit volatile still, you know, from a market standpoint as well. What advice would you give somebody who's maybe been an LP before who wants to transition into a GP role if you had one elevator ride to give somebody some advice trying to get into the business and move maybe to the sponsor side uh, about doing that in 2024, 2025? Yeah, there's two key things that I always uh, talk about that I, I think is important for anyone trying to get into the business. It's education and relationships, right? Get educated on everything that you possibly can and then, and then, and then do more, right? I mean, I am constantly learning new things, uh, taking classes, uh, and, and I've, you know, I think I've got some good experience, but I always think I can learn more. So always be learning. And, and it's all about relationships. It's a relationship business. Uh, I mean, most of life is about relationships, but uh, developing the right relationships is, is, is the key. Love that. Yeah. Last question from me, Matt. Uh, I was actually very touched by the presentation that you delivered at the uh, the meetup back in November, right? Kind of focusing more on the thoughtful landlord and the thoughtful owner, if you will. And you know, I think we talk a lot about syndication and raising capital and GPs and LPs and returns and macroeconomics and taxes and all that stuff. At the end of the day, we provide clean, safe places for people to live. And I thought that the thought, you know, I thought that the presentation you shared with the audience that day was was fantastic. And frank, quite frankly, a differentiated voice compared to a lot of the stuff that we've been hearing. So can you bless our audience uh, with a little bit of that content here before we wrap up? Oh, I'd be happy to. I'm a very, very big proponent of reinventing property ownership as a positive for communities. Um, you know, I have a couple of videos on YouTube that go into more detail for anyone who's watching this and then wants to know more about it. I have one on real estate uh, investment is activism um, and, and a few others. Um, there's actually a playlist on, on my YouTube channel all about that. Um, I think that the press will, you know, sensationalizes, right? Uh, these evil landlords, and there's bad guys out there, but the vast majority of the people that are interested in real estate, that are investing in real estate, are like regular guys like you and me, <laughs> and not not evil some lords, right? Like the guy, the fat guy with like the cigar poking out of his mouth, right? You know, in the white tank top, yelling at people, right? Yeah, right. Like that's that's not who we are, right? And um, it's really important to me to try to make landlords actually be heroes, right? Can't landlords be heroes? Why do we have to be the bad guys in every drama? Yep. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. And so one of the things that's really important to me is uh, making sure that everything that we do at any of our properties is a is a win-win situation. So it's a win for uh, for the residents of the community. It's a win for the staff at our communities. And then ultimately it's a win for us, right? And our investors, we have a profit motive. This is not a charity, but I think you can do well by doing good. And we do lots of different things like 
We give away uh, turkeys around Thanksgiving. We uh, about every six weeks, six to eight weeks, we'll do something different. We do a holiday uh, porch decorating contest. We'll do surprise and delights. We do ice cream socials and like bouncy castles and face painting when school gets out for the kids and all different kinds of things like that to try to foster a good sense of community, try to give back to to the tenants. And when we do have uh, residents at our properties who are falling on hard times, we do our best to try to work with them. We're not in the business of kicking people out of their homes. And actually one of the most expensive things to do is to turn a unit. So if we can figure out a way to work through payment plans uh, so that we can keep a tenant in place who maybe has lost a job or something like that, we, we, we do whatever we can to bend over back, backwards to work with them. Now they have to hold up their end of the bargain too. Like I said, it's not a charity, but um, it's something that's really important to me. Just trying to, like I said, I'm not curing cancer, but I think I can leave the world like a little bit better than I found it. And that's something that I'm trying to do. Amazing. I love that. I love that. Yeah. We, we, so everybody who's listening, go hit the back button for the last 90 to 120 seconds and go listen to everything Matt just said again. I, I will admit though, as you were talking about kind of the, the bad guys, if you will, with the white tank top and the, and the cigar, I think we've all seen a couple of those guys in New York, by the way, you know what the visual I had was, I don't know if Nick and Brian are going to remember this because they're youngsters. You probably will remember the super with Joe Pesci. Did you see uh, that movie? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Case in point. Yeah, exactly. So if you're listening to this show and you have not seen, I was going to say the super, <laughs> but it's super with Joe Pesci back in the day. I think it was like the nine, late 80s yeah. or 90s. Go check it out. Okay, Go watch yeah. that show. That's your homework. I don't think I'd check it out. <laughs> Definitely do that. Definitely do that. Matt, we appreciate the time, brother. Everybody go check out the Backstage Guide to Real Estate. Make sure you check out Pacheni.com, P-I-C-H-E-N-Y.com, forward slash five. I said forward slash today, guys. I nice. get that wrong all the time. Good I job. always say backslash. I have no idea what either of those mean. <laughs> forward slash five. Uh, where else can people connect with you, Matt? Uh, th I think that's the best thing, you know, just, just through my website, all my socials, there's links to all of them on the bottom of the website. You can contact me through email, set up a meeting on my calendar, like just go to Pacheni.com. Love that, man. Nice. Appreciate it. Thanks to Deep Blue Capital over at DeepBlueRE.com. Make sure you check out there and sign up for the newsletter. TourStudios.com, T-O-R-E Studios for all of your multimedia and podcast needs. Episode 35 in the tank. It was a great one. Absolutely. By the way, if uh, anybody who's listening knows Jay-Z, tell him I gave him a shout out on the show and then yeah. he can call us at any time. Feel free. I'll, I'll make the time. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, we'll have to do it again soon, brother. We yeah. appreciate the time, man. This Thanks was awesome, Matt. Thanks so much, brother. Bye.